Our text this morning is from Genesis chapter 48. We are preaching through the book of Genesis. It's been written a long time ago, but it is the true word of God. And the thing that's amazing about it is that it is relevant. It is applicable to today. It is true. And it is sufficient for all of our needs. So the timeless word of God is open before you today. Genesis 48, hear the word of God. After this, Joseph was told, behold, your father is ill. So he took with him his two sons, Manasseh and Ephraim, and it was told to Jacob, your son Joseph has come to you. Then Israel summoned his strength and sat up in bed, and Jacob said to Joseph, God Almighty appeared to me at Luz in the land of Canaan and blessed me and said to me, Behold, I will make you fruitful and multiply you, and I will make you a company of peoples and will give this land to your offspring after you for an everlasting possession. And now your two sons, who were born to you in the land of Egypt before I came to you in Egypt, are mine. Ephraim and Manasseh shall be mine, as Reuben and Simeon are. And the children that you fathered after them shall be yours. They shall be called by the name of their brothers in their inheritance. As for me, when I came from Padan to my sorrow, Rachel died in the land of Canaan on the way, where there was still some distance to go to Ephrath. And I buried her there on the way to Ephrath, that is, Bethlehem. And when, when Israel saw Joseph's sons, he, he said, Who are these? Joseph said to his father, they are my sons whom God has given me here. And he said, bring them to me, please, that I may bless them. Now the eyes of Israel were dim with age so that he could not see. So Joseph brought them near him and he kissed them and embraced them. And Israel said to Joseph, I never expected to see your face and behold, God has let me see your offspring also. Then Joseph removed them from his knees, and he bowed himself with his face to the earth. And Joseph took them both, Ephraim in his right hand toward Israel's left, and Manasseh to his, in his left hand toward Israel's right hand, and brought them near him. And Israel stretched out his hand and laid it on the head of Ephraim, who was the younger, and his left hand on the head of Manasseh, crossing his hands. For Manasseh was the firstborn. And he blessed Joseph and said, the God before whom my fathers Abraham and Isaac walked, the God who has been my shepherd all my life long to this day, the angel who has redeemed me from all evil, bless the boys. And in them let my name be carried on, and the name of my fathers Abraham and Isaac, and let them grow into a multitude in the midst of the earth. When Joseph saw that his father laid his right hand on the head of Ephraim, it displeased him, and he took his father's hand to move it from Ephraim's head to Manasseh's head. And Joseph said to his father, Not this way, father, since this one is the firstborn. Put your right hand on his head. But his father refused and said, I know, my son. I know. He also shall become a people, and, and he also shall be great. Nevertheless, his younger brother shall be greater than he, and his offspring shall become a multitude of nations. So he blessed them that day, saying, By you, Israel, will pronounce blessings, saying, God, make you as Ephraim and as Manasseh. Thus he put Ephraim before Manasseh. Then Israel said to Joseph, Behold, I am about to die, but God will be with you and will bring you again to the land of your fathers. Moreover, I have given to you, rather than to your brothers, one mountain slope that I took from the hand of the Amorites with my sword and with my bow. You notice the name Israel mentioned over and over again. That is Jacob. That is his new covenant name. And he is called all through the chapter as Israel, reminding us that he is walking with the Lord. Jacob is now 147 years old. Joseph gets word that Jacob is nearing the end. Joseph comes to his father's bedside with his two sons, Manasseh and Ephraim. Jacob knew what he was going to do. He wants to bring Joseph back into the fold of the covenant people. 
He had grown up in Jacob's family, you remember. He had deep ties with the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. But he has been gone for many years, and he has now risen to prime minister in Egypt. He was a man of wealth, influence, and responsibility. But Jacob needs to remind Joseph that he is not on the fringe of the covenant. He is first and foremost the heir of all the promises. Remember, he is not primarily Pharaoh's man. He is God's man. And Jacob wants Joseph to know his identity is not as a child of Egypt, but as a child of God. He has a greater inheritance, a greater inheritance in the covenants of God than in all of the wealth of Egypt. Now that's hard to believe. Do you believe that? That you have a greater inheritance in the blessings of heaven, in the treasures of grace, in the work of Jesus Christ, than you do in all of this world's riches. And Joseph's two sons are, are like the second generation of immigrants who only know bits and pieces of their family's history. They, they need to know that they are more than Egyptian boys of privilege. They are a part of God's promises too. They got to know their grandfather over the last 17 years and they heard him tell his story and now it was time for them to be brought formally into the family of Jacob. So Joseph's two sons are called to his bedside in order that Joseph's place would be permanently fixed among the tribes of Israel. Of the twelve sons, there is no tribe of Joseph, but there are the tribes of Ephraim and Manasseh. That makes thirteen. You're saying, how can there be twelve? Well, Levi had a portion of all of the tribes and did not have a tribe named after him. The line of promise is now passed from Jacob to Joseph, and it would not die in Egypt. God was giving Jacob the land promised to his fathers and his father and grandfather and the sons of Joseph would have a stake in it. Jacob will eventually call all of his sons to stand before him to bless them, but he calls these first because Joseph is the heir apparent even though he is one of the youngest. To him comes the double portion. To him is passed the mantle of the family treasures of grace realized in his two friends. And here's the theme. If there's one thing Genesis teaches us among the many lessons to be found, it is this. God wants his gospel to be passed on from generation to generations until his purposes are completed. The blessings of God are not to be hoarded, but to be passed on. There is a legacy of grace, of God's faithfulness, and of his promises that will stand when everything else crumbles. If you had a video camera that morning, on, uh, that day, on, on this scene, you would, you would see an old man with wrinkles, with weak eyes. He was probably not totally blind, but certainly could not see very well. But you would hear his voice, a voice perhaps raspy with age, but, but strong in conviction. And you would hear him speak the legacy of God's mighty works. Jacob wants to finish strong. And he wants those sons of Joseph to know that it does little good to gain the whole world if you lose your, your own soul. Joseph and his sons must make the same kind of judgment that Moses later would make. It was said of Moses that he would forsake the riches of Egypt and identify with the people of God rather than to enjoy the fleeting pleasures of sin. Jane Levy, in her biography of Mickey Mantle, entitled The Last Boy, recounts comments from Mantle's last press conference in July of 1995. Mickey Mantle was one of the greatest baseball players who ever played the game. He had been an alcoholic. The, the room was packed. 
He was thin and sickly in his tracksuit. And Levy quotes Mickey Mantle. God gave me a great body and an ability to play baseball. God gave me everything, and I just... How do you spell P-F-F-T. What would be remembered was, was the anguish plea to children. I'd like to say to the kids out there, if you're looking for a role model, this is a role model. Don't be like me. A reporter asked Mantle if he had signed a donor's card. He said, everything I've got is worn out. Although I've heard people say they'd like to have my heart. It's never been used. Wow. He was a man with so much to offer, but he did not finish well. Boys and girls, young people, men and women, who are the people that you admire? Who are the people that have left a legacy of grace to you? Jacob looks back on who God is. Jacob wants his son and his grandsons to know the ever-present, all-glorious God of the Bible. And in, in this legacy, he recounts who God is and what God has done. And there is no shred of boasting at all. It's not about him and his goodness. It is about God and his grace. There's not a shred of complaining. He did that before, but not now. The language of the chapter is the language of an adoption ceremony. The ceremony begins with a statement of authority that you have uh, to do what you are doing. The God of Abraham and Isaac is my God. I have forgotten him for many years, but he has always been faithful. He appeared to me, Jacob says, at Luz, that's another name for Bethel, and I heard his promise. I saw the angels of God descending and ascending back up into heaven. I learned that God is near and that he has a mighty purpose for me and for the entire world. God promised Jacob that he would be fruitful and would multiply. Now, where have you heard those words before? Those are the words of Adam and Eve in Genesis, in the Garden of Eden. Their sin did not remove them uh, or remove the commandment. What they lost in sin could be restored in the mighty works of God, the Redeemer. It is still his call to us today to be fruitful in the things of grace, to multiply not only physically but spiritually the promises of God. God assured Jacob that there is a land for his descendants where they will live and where he will be their God. The legacy looks back on God's faithfulness. And this raises a huge question for you. What is important to you for your children and for your grandchildren? What legacy do you want to leave with them? How do you want them to remember you? Well, what's your priority for them? Certainly you want them to find their way in the world. You want them to do well in school. You want them to be but responsible citizens and productive members of society. You want them to live well, to marry well, to work well. But what do you want to pass on to them that will stick when everything else passes away? You'll drive them anywhere and everywhere to give them soccer practice and to give them music lessons and to do everything this world has to offer. But when it comes to driving them to church to be with God's people, there is a hesitancy and a failure. The greatest value for your descendants is not that they make money, but that they put their hope in God. That's the point of Psalm 78. We will tell the next generation the glorious deeds of the Lord and his might and the wonders he has done so that they will put their trust in him and not forget the works of God. So we teach the word. We live the word. You may not have children of your own, but you are a spiritual parent, a brother and sister. You have a place in the family of God, and you can make a part of that legacy. 
as a nursery care worker, as a Sunday school teacher, as one who moves among the families of the church, that you know their names, the names of the children. That you be an example to them, that you are in attendance and that you are focused on, on them. We are losing a generation of children and God is calling us to wake up. You have a crucial impact on the next generation. And let me remind you as kids to grab hold of that legacy when you're going to be faced in this world with all kinds of competition with the gospel and all kinds of idols are going to be thrown at you and all kinds of things that are going to distract you from walking with the Lord remain faithful to Him. The stuff of this world will fall away. It's Teflon. It's the things of God that will last. And as he looks into the faces of his son and his grandson, there's something that he sees that looks like Rachel. Something in their eyes, something in their smile. He sees it, and I don't know whether he meant to say it or not, but he said that he lost his precious wife as she birthed Benjamin. And that was a part of his story, too. Jacob would agree with Job when he said, the Lord gives, the Lord takes away, blessed be the name of the Lord. That is a part of the legacy, that God may touch our lives and bless our lives and give us much for which we are thankful, but he also brings to our door sorrow and grief and pain, but God is able to heal us and to strengthen us and we can say whether he gives or whether he takes blessed be the name of the Lord that is our legacy this is the God of Abraham Isaac and Jacob we recount who God is we must pass on the conviction that he has kept us and he will be faithful and he is not only the God of Abraham Isaac and Jacob but he is your God too see the connection happened a long time ago but it is passed on and we are here today because of a legacy of grace a legacy of faithful promises that stand the test of time they stand to this day and they will stand for all eternity amen the second thing you will see with your video camera and here is the blessing of God's adoption Jacob says in verse 5, your two sons are mine, just as Reuben and Simeon are mine. The children born to you after them are yours, but these are claimed for me. If the legacy looks back, then the blessing looks ahead. In verse 8, Jacob, whose eyes are failing, sees the boys up close and he asks, who are these? Well, it's, it's not that he doesn't know who they are. It's a part of the, the ceremony, like in a wedding. Who gives this woman to be married to this man? Well, duh, we know who's giving him. It, it, we, want the, we want the father to say, her mother and I. And when we, we bring our children for baptism, we ask the father, what is the name of the child? That's good to hear because sometimes I forget. But it's not because we don't know the name of the child. It's because we want the father to take his place to say this is a child of the covenant, my son or my daughter. Joseph answers, they are my sons, soon to be yours. He brings them near and they probably go down on one knee in front of them and he embraces them and he kisses them. Now the boys are about 20 years old. So when verse 12 says that Joseph removed them from his father's knees, uh, it does not mean that they were sitting on his knees. They were probably kneeling in front of him. And then Joseph takes them and puts his hands on them and he moves them back. And Joseph himself, in a position of homage and honor to his father, falls down before him. He's agreeing to the adoption ceremony. And Joseph then puts the boys in front of Jacob so that Manasseh is on Jacob's right hand because he's the oldest. 
He's making sure that Jacob gives the primary blessing to Manasseh. And then he does something strange. He crosses his hands. But, but before we look at that strange action, we need to see the blessing that he is about to pronounce. It's a blessing for Joseph. It's a blessing. I'm blessing Joseph, but I'm blessing you, Joseph, through your two sons. It'll be fulfilled in them. And that blessing is in verses 15 and 16. The God who has been my shepherd all my life long to this day, the angel who has redeemed me from all evil, bless the boys. The angel with whom I wrestled, the God of my fathers, bless these boys and deliver them as he has delivered me. Listen, long before David ever penned, the Lord is my shepherd, Jacob had those words on his mouth and he could recite if he knew it, word for word, that psalm, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me to lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside quiet waters. He restores my soul. He prepares a table before me in the presence of my enemies. Jacob knew it all, and he said, God is faithful. This shepherd man had a greater shepherd. And Jacob had confessed it. Jacob goes on. In the future, the people of God will invoke their names and say, may God make you as Ephraim and Manasseh. What a legacy. God did bless them. We learn in Scripture that they grew in numbers more than any of the other tribes. These are solid words of hope and of comfort. Jacob has stepped up to the plate. It is, a, it is an adoption ceremony. And remember, Jesus Christ came into the world to make you sons and daughters of the living God. We are counted as a people who were not a people. You are a son and daughter who has no claim to the family of God. He, he revealed Christ to you, and you embraced him, and he brought you in. And you are no longer an enemy, but a friend. You are no longer an orphan, but a well-loved child. You are no longer a slave. You are no longer a stranger. But you are a fellow citizen of God's household. You are precious sons and daughters of God. And Jesus is your brother. The picture of adoption right here. That God takes us and makes us his own. And you notice his frailty. You hear his words of blessing, but there's one more thing that the, that the video camera picks up. You also see his hands wrinkled and gnarled. And, and perhaps the video camera zooms in on those hands as they reach out to the heads of the boys. And Jacob then crosses his hand. It is a, it is a reversal of blessing. The greater blessing goes to the younger. You know, this has been happening all through the book of Genesis. The blessing does not go to Abraham's firstborn Ishmael, but to Isaac. And Jacob tricks his old man who is blind, and he steals the birthright from his older brother Esau. And Jacob must have remembered that. But this time there is, there is no trick. This is what God wants. This is what God does best. And Joseph, what does he do? He protests. He says, this is not the way it is done. But Joseph, of all people, should have known better. The greater promise goes to Joseph and not to Reuben. There will be a blessing for them, but the right of the firstborn in God's family does not go to the first, but it goes to the last. There's nothing we can point to that says we deserve God's grace or that we have earned it. He did not place his right hand on Ephraim because, because he was a better man than Manasseh, but because of grace. It always points to grace. He will do what he wants, even if it is counterintuitive and goes against whatever we think or believe. Please don't miss this. The boys are 20 years old. And Jacob is not embarrassed at all by his display of affection. Think, think of his hands again. Look, look at your own hands. What, what have your hands done? What have they been through? The, the good and, and the bad. Your hands represent your entire life. 
his hands find the heads of the boys. And they're strong hands of love. The same hands that were covered in fur in his days of deceit are opened in love to the boys. The hands that worked so hard to win Rachel for 14 years are hands that caressed his wife as she lay dying. Those, those hands that took the cloak that belonged to Joseph. A, a, a coat covered with the blood of an animal and that blood was mingled with his tears as he held that coat and he thought he had lost his well-loved son. Those hands now rest on the heads of these boys who have so much to live for. The hands that wrestled with the angel and clung to that angel until he was blessed now rest on those boys. He could extend his hands to them because Jacob finally learned that God's heart and hands were extended to him. He opens his hands to God, God fills them with himself, and he pours out what he receives into the lives of his children as he places his hands on their heads. That's the power of a blessing. The hands of Jacob. He opens his hands to God. And God's grace passes through his hands to them. The hands of his shepherd upheld him, and he would ask God to uphold his sons and his grandsons. Our nation's children are suffering today because so many of them do not experience their father's touch. If the gospel shows us anything, it shows us the importance and the power of touch. As we come to the Lord's table, I remind you of the Father's touch. I remind you of the hands of our Lord Jesus Christ that were never afraid to touch. If there was a leper, he would touch them. Don't touch him, Jesus. His, his filth and his sin may be put on you. And he welcomed it. If there was an Ebola victim back then, he would touch him too. Here is the place of blessing. Jesus would take on our sickness that we would take on his righteousness. The hands that broke the bread are the hands that were pierced for your sins. Those hands that wrestled with God in the garden of Gethsemane. When Jesus cried out, not my will, but yours be done. Those hands were pierced by spikes, incurring the agony of the cross for him and for you. Those hands that broke the bread and poured the cup for us are now extended wide to embrace you. Even as Jacob's arms were extended to embrace his grandson, Jesus Christ, the Lord of the covenant, covenant, leans forward and gathers us in his arms, and he says, trust me. I know what I'm doing, I know where I'm going, and you are safe. My hands of love will uphold you. Now let me ask you, what will you do with your hands today? Let's pray. Lord Jesus, may I use my lips to proclaim the legacy. May I use my hands to bestow the blessings of God, to speak and to touch the lives of others. Strengthen us now in this communion meal, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.